Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk about recognizing the bar line. First, want to just uh, note the passing of a great man, David Wessel. Uh, we got word that he died yesterday. Um, it was a wonder, uh, a polymath is the, the first word that comes to mind. Uh, David was the kind of person who would have been at a gathering like this one and had something uh, interesting and uh, well-informed and original to say to everybody in the room. Um, so he will be missed. Um, I went through my sordid past uh, last time when we were here, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. I'll throw up a couple of slides from uh, the talk last time, uh, kind of in the spirit of the TV shows where we say in our last episode you saw this. Uh, so just uh, recapping why this kind of project is of <clears throat> interest to NYU because uh, we are the, uh, have pretty well established ourselves as a global network university at this point. You see the, uh, on the right there the uh, map of the portals and sites. So the three with the circles around them are the so-called portals where you can register and get a degree, uh, New York, Abu Dhabi, and Shanghai. And then the uh, sites, where, which are locations where you can go to uh, study courses in particular locations, including Berlin, London, Paris, Prague, Florence, Madrid, Ghana, uh, Buenos Aires, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, and I think that's it. Um, and uh, I think I showed this last time, but that's one of our board, a member of our board of trustees, uh, Chandrika Tandon, who uh, is also a very uh, fine singer and uh, tours with Kenny Werner, so it's a interesting combination of uh, musical styles in itself. When you talk to her, she's a very accomplished uh, businesswoman and a board of trustees of NYU, but she, what she really wants to talk about is her music making. Vishnu, Jishnu, Maha Vishnu. Anyway, it's beautiful material that you should check out. Um, the only slide I'll repeat of my uh, prior <coughs> work uh, is um, from this concert that we did at the Banff Center in 1989 with Steve Coleman, who recently got word that he is uh, one of this year's MacArthur recipients. Uh, so it's particularly related, I think I played it last time too, because uh, of the way that it deals rhythm with rhythm from an algorithmic standpoint. So at the very beginning of this excerpt, you hear, in fact, a drummer that Steve himself programmed uh, using uh, Markov models of uh, Smitty Smith. Uh, so just sat Smitty down and kind of interviewed him about which uh, instruments he was most likely to hit on which beat and wrote a Markov chain uh, to represent that. Uh, this is a trio between uh, Steve, Muhal Richard Abrams, and my software that listens to, in this case, Steve in particular, and then plays along with them. So uh, my software is playing on a Yamaha disc clavier, acoustic piano, while he's playing on a synthophone, which is a saxophone filled with electronics so it can see which um, keys he's hitting when, basically sending out MIDI information about that. Uh, so then my software analyzes what he does uh, and plays along with him. Uh, so I'll start this and kind of talk through it. Um, at the very beginning, you can hear Steve's drummer, which is quite interesting in itself. <laughs> Right now, this is a duet between Steve and Cypher, my software, uh, him on the synthophone and Cypher on the piano. And in a moment, he's going to stop playing. This is related to what we talked about with George's uh, presentation the other day, is that when no more input comes, my software starts listening to itself. So it hooks up its own output to its own input, analyzes what it just played, and modifies that and keeps going around in this kind of uh, structural feedback loop.
So here's the software playing on its own. Okay, I'll stop that there. Um, a very wise man once said that uh, uh, although responsive to stimulus properties, pulse and meter are not themselves stimulus properties. These terms refer to endogenous dynamic temporal reference that shape experiences of musical rhythm. So um, pulse uh, and certainly meter aren't in the music. They are in us. Uh, they are formed in us as a response to what we listen to, which is uh, what makes it difficult <coughs> to uh, write software to, um, to experience the same thing, because we're trying to recreate a human experience in response to musical stimulus. So what you're modeling is actually a listener, and listeners differ. Uh, listeners differ according to their own musical background, uh, experience, interests, uh, and so forth. Um, so the relationship between uh, the musical surface that we're looking at and what we're trying to model is in itself uh, has some kind of variability uh, that makes it tricky to capture, and that's why we're all sitting here trying to figure this out now. Um, so what kind of representations we use of that uh, surface material uh, to some extent determines what it is that we can ask about it and what we can know. Uh, so the representations are critically important for um, both the analysis side, what it is that we can do to, uh, to represent the music and analyze it. Uh, Guy's talk was, uh, I think, a good example of, of that uh, in looking at the m multiple metrical levels and what that means in terms of how you can represent the music and how people are able to make sense of it. Uh, in Godfrey's work also, he uses a representation <coughs> of basically on-off patterns for the clave son, for example. So you can see various ways of representing it there in uh, either musical uh, notation <coughs> or uh, bits uh, on and off patterns. Um, and uh, then you can uh, analyze it in various ways, which is what uh, Gottfried has done and uh, what I'm sure he'll talk more about uh, tomorrow. It's related closely to the Lerdo and Jackendorf dot notation. Uh, many other people have used this. It's also, again, similar to what Guy was just talking about, where you put uh, dots <coughs> at uh, each level of the metric hierarchy. Uh, so in this case, uh, the lowest level um, is the eighth notes that you see there. So there's a little asterisk underneath the eighth notes, uh, then reinforced by quarter notes above that, half notes, and then uh, whole notes. So trying to track what the various uh, temporal levels are in a, an excerpt like this one. Another way to look at it is basically put it in a circle. So uh, there's actually a 13th century version of that, of the clave son uh, from Gottfried's article. Uh, this is a tree of similarity that Gottfried's software is able to compute. Uh, and over there is from uh, Justin London's book uh, showing how you can represent these kinds of sequences as a circle, in fact. So it's really kind of taking the dot notation and connecting the two ends into a cycle so that you see how these things uh, repeat over time. Um, I'm not sure he's going to show it, so just as a way of uh, demonstrating the relationship between analysis and generation, uh, I love this video. Someone made hardware implementing uh, Gottfried's uh, Euclidean algorithm. So um, for those of us on the creation side, let's skip ahead here. <coughs> So this is using Godfrey's idea of uh, maximally evenly spaced impulses within a uh, circle of, um, of uh, let's say, odd-numbered pulses. There's several of them layered on top of each other. So from a generative standpoint, I mean, partly what we're going to be doing with this project is analyzing a corpus, coming up with a representation, some way of uh, saying something meaningful about that corpus, and then using the same representations to produce a generative application that would uh, further elucidate that material in some way. Uh, so in the M.I. Eric community, certainly there's been a lot of work done on popular music. Uh, popular music is... Um, uh, an obvious target for several reasons. First of all, because it's relatively easy to get. You can just buy it. 
Um, and also because you would think that rhythmically, at least, uh, it's pretty obvious what's going on. So it makes it relatively easy to analyze. Uh, the temptations make it easy, for example, to find uh, the rhythmic levels in uh, this excerpt. So the hits come on the downbeat. Uh, so, you know, those are easy to find. Uh, so you could find that as the, uh, the meter. And then the subdivisions within that. But uh, then you can look at something like uh, Salif Keita, who has the same hits, but they're not they're not articulating uh, the downbeat. So it's two, three, four, not one. Uh, so again, it's in the mind of the listener what what this material means. It's, it's being produced in us. If you looked at it simply as a stimulus. I mean, these hits are happening, are very similar between both excerpts, but they mean something different according to our expectations and uh, the musical styles. Um, so in Salif Kaeta's uh, example, this is a much more syncopated uh, use of the material. I feel it only fair to give you this warning I discovered yesterday from Ladies Home Journal in uh, August 1921. Scientists have found uh, when working with the insane that uh, regular rhythms and simple tones produce a quieting effect on the brain of even a violent patient, but the effect of jazz on the normal brain produces an atrophied condition of the brain cells of conception until very frequently those under the demoralizing influence of the persistent use of syncopation combined with inharmonic partial tones are actually incapable of distinguishing between good and evil, right and wrong. So I think you're all too far gone, but <laughs> In any case, I thought you should know. Um, but pop music is not obvious for a number of reasons. First of all, as I just showed, you could have the same stimulus that means different things in different contexts. Uh, and uh, pop composers use metrical ambiguity uh, for effect. Uh, so this is one of my favorite examples. If you listen to the beginning of Caroline, no, Brian Wilson is actually confusing us as to where the downbeat is. So there's chick, 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 boom, chick, chick. Boom, and you would expect that the boom is one, but actually it's three, as you find out once uh, the voices come in. Where did your long hair go? Where is the girl I used to know? So, um, it's not that obvious, and uh, this uh, example also comes from last time, uh, <clears throat> as Kofi was telling us about uh, the high life timeline. I mean, you, so you have these impulses. It's the same thing I've been obsessing about uh, for the last 18 months. So if you take this from the Lairdall and Jackendoff perspective, uh, and in music theory, you know, ear training class, you would notate this as three, four, one, two, three, four, one. As uh, Lairdall and Jackanoff would tell us that the longest duration should be, is preferred to be heard as the downbeat. Um, but in the high life timeline, the same set of three impulses is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So in fact, the dots don't have any energy on them. Uh, again, the dots are in our head, they're not in the music. So. You, are, you have to interpre interpret the same set of stimuli in different ways according to different listeners and different traditions. Um, so then it starts to get complicated. How can we do this? Another representation certainly would be to take uh, Ed's way of looking at the world uh, where you consider um, <clears throat> rhythm and meter to be uh, actually waves of expectation where you expect things to take place. Um, that works, uh, I think, has great results from an analytical standpoint, and, and uh, as Ed was telling us uh, the other day, is uh, confirmed in brain activity and so forth. So um, analytically, uh, has a lot to tell us. Uh, I think that I, I'm going to pin Ed down and try and think about how we could use it uh, generatively. Um, but there's many things that uh, we've heard about today that we can, um, or in this week, that we can use as we start to structure this project. So uh, extracting meter, meter from audio. Um, Andre is going to be here uh, working on this project for the next couple of months, uh, who brings uh, both skill from uh, musicology and from computational modeling, so can help us think about where to get the material. I mean, partially you're, you're constrained by how you represent the material, and then you're constrained by what material you can get. 
so what corpus can we find to work on that would um, be interesting to work on and uh, relatively complete? So we've heard about that kind of thing. Also this week, uh, I mean, there's various places to look, uh, <clears throat> including from our colleagues at uh, Comp Muse. Uh, there's a library in Tunisia and so forth. There's a collection of uh, pearl diving music that we have access to. Um, uh, Gerard was telling me that Monder uh, Yari, who was here last time, has an extensive uh, digital collection of Arabic music. So one of the first things we'll need to do is figure out what repertoire we want to try to say something about. Um, another one would be uh, the work of Um Kultum, uh, certainly one of the, the great uh, Arabic singers. And we have uh, Ginny Danielson, who wrote the book <laughs> about her. So uh, that is also an obvious place to start, uh, this kind of material. <laughs> Look on the web and you can find uh, videos from both Shakira and Beyonce using material from, uh, from Um Kultum. Um, so there's an attraction in that of taking the, uh, the output of one particular artist because it's circumscribed, you can get it all, uh, and you can say something in particular about that, the work of that person and then how it relates to other traditions. So for example, we could look at some of the work that's happened in Comp Muse, try to unravel those influences on the work of uh, artists uh, from this region. Uh, Jenny also suggested uh, Muhammad Abdu might be a good target for this kind of uh, treatment. <laughs> So in listening to this, we all bring our own uh, set of experiences and, uh, and interests in terms of how we might make sense of it and uh, think about it computationally even, or think about it analytically. And then for those of us on the generative side, what we might do once we had those tools to create something uh, new from that material. Uh, Jelly Roll Morton talked about the Spanish tinge in, uh, in his music, meaning actually he was talking about Cuban music. Um, saying that it uh, really changes the color from red to blue. Uh, you notice the Spanish tinge. In fact, if you can't manage to put tinges of Spanish in your tunes, you'll never be able to get the right seasoning, I call it, for jazz. So uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion of, um, of the phenomenon of what's called the Mediterranean sound or Mediterranean music, which is the influence of various cultures around the Mediterranean on each other and on the Arabic music in particular. One current artist who talks about that quite a bit is Amr Diab. Uh, actually, this video uh, I uh, dedicate to, to Gottfried. I think that he should uh, adopt this as his theme song.
interesting to see the, the claveson used that way. Uh, I mean, you can look at something like this and just the mind boggles at the, uh, at the amount of influences from, from popular culture, from video culture, from uh, various musical styles. Um, just play this briefly because I'm almost out of time. I mean, this is where we could just take the echo nest uh, ways of talking about popular music and applying that to this uh, to this literature. Uh, I mean, you're going to get a quick jump start right there in terms of trying to find how it relates to the Western popular music um, tradition, uh, but then how it also relates to to a number of the cultures around uh, the Mediterranean. So um, what we're hoping for is to make this feedback loop between analysis uh, that will produce some kinds of representations that will feed uh, some generative processes uh, that hopefully will be able to feed back into the analysis uh, to improve it. So some of the things I'm thinking, I'm personally thinking about most immediately would be to take Gottfried's representation that's kind of one level of dot notation and even just add a second level. So instead of having one bit to represent each time point, to put two bits there uh, so that you can show what the second metrical level is, how much of his techniques in terms of measuring similarity, complexity, and so forth could then be applied to a two-bit representation instead of a one-bit representation. We've gotten very far using one bit. Let's just add another level and see you know, what that changes in terms of how you have to compute it and what it tells you uh, as a result. Another um, thing I'm interested in is talking to Ed about how we might think about oscillators. I think they're a great way of representing what's being produced in listeners' heads as we're listening to music, how this endogenous process works. Um, but how from a generative side could we think about oscillators and phases and, uh, and entrainment um, in producing new output? Uh, and so moving where the oscillators are, or how would you actually think about that as a representational system that could be used uh, generatively? Um, so uh, there's you know, a big, uh, big ball of things that we have to think about here, which is uh, why it's so useful to have you all here, uh, because it's a great uh, combination of expertise that can help us uh, get this launched. Um, but that's all I have to say about it, so I'd be happy to, uh, to hear if you have any ideas for us. <clears throat> We're looking for uh, suggestions and <laughs> comments rather than questions, but questions are questions also welcome. Too? Sure. I, I, have a, I have a question, maybe to everybody, but could we flip back to the page where you had notated the, um, the timeline for the highlight, which we had there? I just want to know, I, I consider it myself a bit of a uh, linguistic or cultural bias that the first interpretation is is a starting point but but um, that may be because I don't know enough but uh, I would consider it that the the choice that long is a preference for downbeat rather than short is a linguistic choice you know well, it's it kind comes of connected to our, our, lang our first language that we might associate um, long with some level of stress, but maybe this is a uh, universal that I don't, I don't understand. I don't think it's universal at all, I think, but it comes from Lerdol and Jackendorf that is very explicitly related to a particular corpus. They don't make any universal claims at all. In fact, they don't even make any claims outside of tonal Western music. In fact, it really works best for the classic period. I mean, even when you get into romantic music, it starts to break down. So they don't make any claims of universi universality at all. Uh, so what I was saying about th that interpretation has to do with their analysis that they say that they very explicitly restrict to a particular corpus. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. 
You know, this is, as usual, quite a, probably quite a naive question, but, you know, in a lot of these music psychology things and neuroscience things, they test babies. Uh, is there a lot of that in the literature? Yeah, there's and quite a bit of that I also. I guess I've been, is there any that you could share with us? Because I haven't seen that so far. People are, well, there are things like, um, a lot of it is when they notice that you've changed something. So if you change uh, the harmonic material or changes in melody or changes, I'd have to look. So there's probably people here who know this literature better than I do in terms of changes in rhythmic behavior that would, because what you do is you try and make the baby look, you know, register a notice of change in some way. Uh, and it's certainly been done melodically. Um, I'd have to look back to see what, how that's been done rhythmically. But uh, th yeah, there are, there's a whole, um, yeah, there's a lot of work in that area. Yeah, maybe if people had examples of that, we could see some of it, because so far I haven't seen any papers that mm -hmm. have brought that out, so there's been a lot of talk about cultural competence affecting the results, and presumably that's why they test babies. But Yeah, yes, you know, yeah. To, anyway. So one possibility that occurs to me in terms of oscillation is um, chaotic oscillators. So um, the oscillations that occur in the real brain are not you know, the simple kinds of ones that are captured in the model. Um, I mean, well, some properties are probably captured in the model that I showed, but, um, you know, um, real neural oscillations are considerably more complex. So you might be able to think of, you know, the kinds of complex patterns that people generate as, you know, chaotic oscillation. And they generate some semi-regular patterns that uh, mm -hmm. sound kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well. Oh, one more. Okay. Not a question, but a comment. So, for working with babies, you could look for Jessica Phillips Silver. She did um, tests with, I think, seven months old babies, like uh, with the stimulus that could be interpreted both in a cycle of three and a cycle of four. And they would bounce half of the babies according to a circle of three and the other half of the babies according to a circle of four. And later on, they would just let them listen to the music with actions hyperimposed to either a three or a four. And they could clearly see that they recognized the rhythm that they had been bounced to oh, and wow. could, make, could make the link. <laughs> and there's also other, I've forgotten the name, but on just on short rhythmic patterns where they play them long sequences of short rhythmic patterns. <clears throat> and they are somehow able to distinguish them. It's pretty amazing at, at hmm. the age of seven months. Well, uh, great. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks.